The topic is plug control. Why, why do we need to do plug control? We, we want to eliminate the most uh, notorious and uh, the one the, the, which is ad adhered firmly to the tooth surface and to the tissues. It penetrates the epithelium and the connective tissue. So this plaque has to be eliminated and how it can be eliminated or it can be disrupted is what we are going to discuss under plaque control. How do we define plaque control? It is a regular removal of dental plaque and prevention of its formation on the teeth and adjacent gingival surfaces. So the first toothbrush was introduced in China in 1498 wherein they used these natural hedgehog bristles and they impregnated them into your ox bone. In 1930, very less expensive nylon filament replaced these hedgehog bristles and wood and plastic replaced the ox bone. Now let's classify your plaque control agents. You can classify them into mechanical plaque control and chemical plaque control. Your mechanical plaque control includes your toothbrushes, your chew sticks, your dental floss and interdental or interproximal cleaning aids. Your mechan again you can classify further subclassify your mechanical plaque control agents into your toothbrush which further can be categorized as manual and electric, interdental aids that is your dental floss, your toothpicks, interdental brushes, super floss and perio aid. The aids for gingival stimulation includes your rubber tip stimulator and balsa wood edge. The others are your gauze strips, your pipe cleaners and your water irrigation devices. The aids that are used for edentulous or partially edentulous patients include your denture and partial clasp brushes and your cleansing, denture cleansing solutions. Now coming to toothbrushes, now your toothbrushes you will have different parts. You have your head, you have your shank and you have your handle. The, and the various types of toothbrushes that are available include your manual, powered, sonic and ultrasonic and ionic toothbrushes. Now, if you take the manual toothbrushes, I told you have three parts. You have your head, you have your shank and, shank, and you have your handle. Now the parts of the uh, uh, toothbrush that we have discussed, in the head itself you have certain tufts, you have bristles, okay, which are the tufts which are arranged in rows and each tuft will have certain number of bristles. If you see the head length, the length of the head of a toothbrush in an adult would be about 13 by 8 inches and about 1 inch in a child, whereas the head width in an adult is about half an inch. It's about half an inch in an adult and 5 by 16 inches in a child. Toothbrush bristles can be class classified as hard or soft, natural or synthetic, multi tufted or space tufted. Your bristle hardness is directly proportional to the diameter of your bristles. Now, if your diameter of the bristle is more, definitely the, the bristle is going to be more stiff and more hard. The bristle, if the bristle length is more longer, then your bristle hardness is going to be less. So if you see the diameter of bristles, you can have, uh, you have soft, medium and hard. The soft brushes will have a bristle diameter of about 0.007 inches. Medium ones will have 0.012 inches and large, uh, sorry, your hard toothbrushes will have 0.014 inches. If you see the length of the toothbrush uh, bristle in an adult, it is about 0.406 inches and then in a child is about 0.344 inches. And each, bra each uh, tuft will have about 80 to 86 bristles. What are the ADA specifications of a toothbrush? The brushing surface should be about 1 to 1.25 inch in length. And then it should be about 5 by 16 to 3 by 8 in width, inches in width. And then it should have about 2 to 4 rows of bristles. And then each row should have about 5 to 10, 12 tufts. And then each tuft will have about 80 to 86 bristles. The recommendations according to the ADA would be that you can, the best ones would be using a soft nylon toothbrushes and that you replace the toothbrush every three months. Coming to the powered toothbrushes, they were invented way back in 1939 and they were introduced or they were started marketing these power toothbrushes in just about 1960. The indications for using these power toothbrushes, anyone can use their power toothbrushes if you can afford, but then it is most commonly preferred in young children, in handicapped patients, and then in patients with certain prosthodontic and endosseous implants, and then in orthodontic patients, in your individuals who are lacking manual dexterity, and in patients on a supportive periodontal therapy. The advantages are there is an increased motivation and a bet so you have a better compliance with the use of a power toothbrush, increased accessibility to the lingual and the proximal surfaces and the decreased brushing force. So you don't have to apply any certain force or brush, you just have to keep it there and that will revolve or that will oscillate. No specific brushing technique is present. 
Now, what is the mechanism of act? Uh, what is the mechanism of action of these uh, power toothbrushes? They mimic a back and forth brushing technique. Now, they rely primarily on the mechanical contact. The best mechanical contact it can make with the tooth, the best would be the efficacy of the toothbrush. Usually, you have an oscillating or rotating kind of a motion with the with which what the brush runs with head runs with. Some brushes produce high frequency vibrations. That is, they produce the cavitation effect and the micro uh, acoustic micro streaming effect. Ionic toothbrushes, they change the surface charge of the tooth and thereby the negatively or the, the same charge of the uh, uh, plug which has the same charge is repelled and the tooth from the tooth and negatively charged bristles. Tooth brushing technique, you have according to the tooth, various tooth brushing techniques, you have uh, the pat depending on the pattern of motion and the position of the brush, you have your roll technique, your vibratory, circular, vertical, horizontal, sulcular and the physiological methods. The roll technique includes your roll method and your modified ch Stillman method. The vibratory techniques are your Stillman's, Charters and your Bass method. And then your circular would be just the phones technique. Your vertical technique will be the Leonard's technique. The horizontal method would be your scrub technique and the sulcular would be be your bass and the physiological one will be your spit technique. Let's go in detail about the most important techniques that you need to know that would be your bass method, modified bass stillman, modified stillman and the charters technique. Your, your bass method is also called as a sulcular brushing method which was introduced by bass in 1948. According to him he said that you have to place the bristles at a 45 degree angle towards the, surf towards the gingival margin that is away from the uh, occlusal surface and then you give slight vibratory uh, shortened back uh, motions okay now what are the indications of this uh, bass technique that would be for all the patients most of the times for periodontal maintenance you have your good bass technique which is advised for your open interproximal areas cervical areas just beneath the height of contour of this enamel and then it also cleans the exposed root surfaces. Patients who have had and undergone a periodontal surgery, you can also advise for adaptation to the abutment teeth under the gingival border of an FPV. Modified bars, what is the difference between the bars and the modified bars? Now in this modified bars, it is basically, it is modified to add a roll stroke. That is, after the activation of the brush head with the back and forth action, the direction of the brush is rolled against the gingiva over the gingiva so you you roll it against the gingiva in an occlusal direction so that it will clear some uh, debris or the uh, clear the interproximal areas coming to the stillman's method now the stillman's method was was put forward by stillman in, in 1932 now, according to this he said that the head of the brush is placed in an oblique direction towards the apex of the tooth and then he said that half the bristles should be placed on the tooth surface and half should be on the gingival margin and the light pressure should be applied together with a vibratory motion the indications is when you have to massage and stimulate your gingiva and for cleaning the cervical areas of the tooth modified stillman the modified stillman again incorporates a rolling technique followed by your vibratory phase the advantages you can give this kind of a stillman method can be adopted in case of people with gingival recession Coming to the Charters method, now this Charters method was described in 1928 and it uses a reverse position of the brush as compared to your Stillman method. You know your Stillman method, the brushes or the bristle heads were facing a pikely towards the root surface, right? Whereas for your Charters method, the bristle heads will face occlusally, in an occlusal direction, right? And you apply light pressure which is used to force the tips into the interproximal embrasures. The most important indication of Charters method is used in patients who have undergone a periodontal flap surgery so the technique would be soft medium bristle uh, multi filament uh, toothbrush is indicated the bristles are placed at a 45 degree angle to the gingiva directed in a coronal direction and the bristles are activated by a vibratory stroke now coming to the interdental aids now we've finished with the toothbrushes let's go on to the interdental aids now you have three types of interdental embrasures you have type 1 type 2 type 3 if you could see the picture the type 1 is very a uh, tight interproximal contact type 2 wherein there is some kind of a interproximal tissue and bone loss and then type c is there is gingival recession with some kind of a interdental with a, a severe interdental and uh, interdental soft tissue and bone loss now if you see in type a type of a gingival embrasure the most advised interdental aid would be use of a dental floss and in type b type you have to use interdental brushes and type c you have to use your unit tufted brushes 
The various forms of dental floss that are available include your multifilament that is twisted or non-twisted types, your bonded or the non-bonded type, you have the thick type of dental floss and you have a thin type of dental floss. Apart from that, you have waxed and unwaxed dental floss. What is the technique of using the floss? Now you have to use, you have to cut approximately of about 12 to 18 inches of the floss in length and then you stretch it or you tie it either to both the index fingers or one thumb finger and then an index finger and then try to insert uh, the uh, floss into the interproximal area of one tooth. Suppose you are introducing into the medial interproximal area of one one and then you, you, you move the dental floss in a sawing motion and then remove it and then reinsert it into the mesial surface of two one. So now that will cover the mesial surface of two one and the mesial surface of uh, one one. Now various other interdental aids include your orange, uh, sorry, your wooden tips. They are basically made out of your orange wood. Now they have a triangular cross section that should rest on the base of the papilla, and then uh, based on the race, uh, sorry, it should rest on the base of the inter, uh, the tip of the interdental papilla. The wooden tips are generally made out of orange wood. They have a triangular and cross section. Okay, the base of the uh, tip should rest on the tip of the interdental papilla, and the tip of the interdental papilla should rest uh, towards your proximal contact. Now, this way, it's going to prevent the harm that it's going to cause to your interdental tissues. They can be of conical uh, of two types. Uh, they usually used in type two embrasures, and they can be of conical types. You can be rubber tips, or you can have plastic tips. And if you see this picture, this beautifully explains. There's one uh, important feature that this picture is explaining. They're saying if your interproximal uh, now, uh, if you see the picture A, okay. Now here the interproximal area is more means the space between. There's loss of interproximal uh, contact. So the, the, there's a larger space between the two teeth, but then there is a use of dental floss here. Now this use of dental floss is not going to be of any use to the patient. If you see the picture B, now because your inter, uh, proximal area is, uh, your brush diameter is bigger than the interproximal areal distance. So you remember that always when you're using an interdental aid, it should be one size bigger than the uh, diameter of your interdental uh, space. Coming to the interproximal brushes, you have unit after cone shape or cylindrical form of brushes. They are available in different degree of hardness. For most efficient cleaning diameter of brush should always be slightly larger than the embrasure to be cleaned. It provides access to the percussion areas, the isolated areas of deep recession and lingual areas of mandibular. Um, it was G.V. Black in 1915 who proposed the use of a syringe filled with water to irrigate the subgingival areas. It is a valuable supplement for mechanical plaque control measures. You have two types of irrigation. You have the in-home irrigation and you have the office irrigation. And then again, you can again subclassify them into supragingival irrigation and subgingival irrigation. It is beneficial in removing of unattached plaque and debris. The irrigation device is basically composed of built-in a pump and reservoir. It may also be used to deliver some antimicrobial agents subgingivally. The mechanism of action, how this uh, irrigation acts, would be it occurs through a direct application of pulsed stream of water or any other solution. Now, this pulsation will provide a compression and decompression phase, and this will cause excellent clearing of bacteria from your uh, pocket. The clinical efficacy, when do you call it more efficacious? When the settings of the uh, the irrigation devices would be a dental water jet with about 1200 pulsations per minute and then it should be medium to high pressure setting of about 50 psi to 90 psi. So a pulsation of 1200 per minute creates two zones of hydrokinetic energy. You have an impact zone and you have a flushing zone. In the impact zone is where exactly you are directing the solution to go through and then from here it is directed to another way that would be a flushing action which goes into your subgingival areas and flush the debris which is present in your subgingival areas. The outcome of the hydrokinetic energy is subgingival penetration. If you can see, these are the pictures which are showing. You have specific tips which are available. One tip is a site specific tip wherein you can actually place it inside your subgingival area and then use do the perform the irrigation method. And then you have a jet tip which is basically used only for your uh, supragingival irrigation. 
Then the most important thing for plaque control mechanically, you need to clean the tongue because you know tongue has lots of grips. You have because you have lots of papillae, uh, the uh, papillae in the tongue, and that's why it becomes a good ecological nike for your microorganisms to get loaded there and create the uh, environment for conducive for damage to your periodontal structures or even your tooth surfaces. Therefore, it becomes important that you use your tongue cleaners and tongue scrapers, which is. Uh, important to remove your deposits on your tongue. That finishes off your mechanical plaque control. Now the second part of plaque control will be your chemical plaque control. You know that your chemical plaque control is the adjunctive use of certain chemicals in order to control the formation and to disrupt the already formed plaque. Now chemical plaque control agents can be classified as antimicrobial agents, plaque reducing or plaque inhibitory agents. You have your anti-plaque agents and you have your anti-gingivitis agents. What are these antimicrobial agents? The antimicrobial agents are chemicals having the bacteriostatic or the bactericidal effect. And then you have your plaque reducing or plaque inhibitory agents which are chemicals that reduce the quantity and or the affect the quality of plaque. Classification of anti-plaque agents depending on the antimicrobial efficacy and relative substantivity. You can classify them as first generation, second generation, third generation chemical plaque control agents. The first generation, they reduce the plaque score just to about 20 to 50 percent. The examples include your antibiotics, your sanguinarin, phenols, quaternary ammonium compounds. The second generation ones are the ones which reduce the plaque to about 70 to 90 percent and these include your bisbigonite under which comes your chlorexidin, which is chlorexidin gluconate. The third generation ones include your delmophenol wherein they just block the binding of microorganisms. Then you can also classify your anti-plaque agents into cationic surfactants and your anionic surfactants. These are the list of cationic surfactants, the most important being your bisbigonites and cetylperidinium chloride which falls under the category of your quaternary ammonium compounds. Apart from that, the other py pyrimidine derivatives and bisperidine derivatives are also under your cationic surfactants. Apart from that, your phenols such as your listerin, triclosan, herbal extracts like sanguinarin, your heavy metal salts like zinc, copper and tin, and then antibiotics like penicillin, vancomycin, erythromycin, etc. And then your enzymes like mucinase, mutinase and your dextronases. What are your anionic surfactants? Your anionic surfactants include your amino alcohols and your plaques, and then others include your fluorides and your oxygenating agents. Coming to the important one that is your bisbigonites and chlorexidin. Now this chlorexidin basically the chemical structure would be it's a chlorexidin digluconate molecule. It has a it, 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 it comes under the category of your bisbigonites. It has antiseptic properties and it is you do have to use the rinse twice daily with about 10 ml of the rinse and it is available in two percentages as a mouthwash. It, it is available in 0.2 and 0.12 percentage. And the substantivity of chlorexidin, the beauty of chlorexidin molecule is that it has 12 hours of substantivity. Means it can be retained in the oral cavity for about 12 whole hours. So, you, if twice daily use of this molecule, of this mouthwash, is sufficient enough to produce good effects. What is the mechanism of action? Basically, it is a broad antibacterial spec. It has a broad antibacterial spectrum, meaning it's effective against gram-positive as well as your gram-negative organisms. In high concentrations, it has a bactericidal property, and in low concentrations, it has a bacteriostatic function. In low concentration, what does it do? The cationic molecules, you know your chlorexidin is a cationic surfactant. It has two cationic uh, it's a di it's a basically it's a dicationic molecule so one part of the cationic molecule will go and bind to the uh, tooth surface whereas that is the pellicle and the other su surface is free the other cationic surface is free which is waiting for the bacteria to come and bind to once the bacteria goes and binds to this cationic uh, uh, charge what it does it it creates certain pores within your uh, bacterial cell wall and then allows and it, it starts to uh, because of the pores that are created all the cell contents of the bacteria are gonna uh, leach out and then the bacteria is gonna die now coming to the quaternary ammonium and that property is called as your pinhole effect. A quaternary ammonium compound include your cetylperidinium chloride and the percentage of use would be your 0.05%. It's also called as your CPC, which is a short form. It's again a cationic molecule and it rapidly binds to your oral tissues. It's rapidly released and it is not as effective as chlorexidin, but it has been quite effective. 
It ruptures again, it ruptures the cell wall and alteration of your cytoplasmic contents and has side effects uh, are similar to that of your chlorhexidin. You know your chlorhexidin has certain side effects which include your metallic stains, you have your certain uh, cases of hypersensitivity rashes have been reported but very rare and then they've also seen that ingestion, if, you, if the patient by mistake ingest, uh, ingest your uh, chlorhexidin into the systemic uh, circulation, nothing happens. So there's not major side effects. So they say that chlorhexidin mouthwash as a mouthwash is supposed to be a gold standard but you can't definitely use it for too long period of time because it can cause little taste alteration, it can cause stains, it can increase calculus formation too. Coming to sanguinarin, it's basically a herbal extract. Again, it is a cationic uh, molecule and it is used as both mouth rinse and a toothpaste. It basically, it's an alkaloid extract from the blood root plant that is sanguinaria candida and Candenesis. It contains the extract of 0.03% and 0.2% of zinc chloride. The plaque reduction of about 17 to 42% and reduces gingivitis to about 17 to 42% again. But it creates burning sensation. So it's basically sanguinarin is the first generation anti plaque agent. Coming to triclosan, again, triclosan is a cationic molecule. Okay, it is available as mouth rinses and it's also incorporated into your dentifrices, bisphenol and non-ionic germicide and with low toxicity and it has a, again a broad spectrum of activity. Various formulations to enhance its efficacy or the ability to bind to plaque and teeth have been incorporated. One is your zinc citrate which increases the anti-plaque effect of triclosan. And then a copolymer co also called as a methoxyethylene and malic acid called as gantrase is being incorporated into your toothpaste in order to increase the availability of your triclosan in the toothpaste. Apart from that, if you can incorporate py pyrophosphate, it will also enhance your anti-calculus properties. Coming to the essential oils, of the essential oils, the most important one which is FDA approved is your Listerin. Now Listerin, the composition of Listerin is, it has thymol, it has eucalyptol, menthol and it has methyl salicylate. Now the plaque reduction is about just only about 20 to 34 percent but you have to use it repeatedly probably four times daily and then that's why the patient compliance would be a little less and some patients have reported the uh, the sensation of burning sensation in the uh, initial burning sensation with Listerin. Cell wall mechanism of action again is cell wall destruction and it inhibits certain bacterial enzymes. Now coming to the dentifrices, now your dentifrices, the term dentifrices, it means a substance that is used with along, along with a toothbrush for the purpose of cleaning accessible surfaces of the teeth. Now this was given by the ADA Council of Dental Therapeutics. Therapeutics. Then you have composition, you have your polishing or the abrasive agents which include your calcium carbonate, your dicalcium phosphate dihydrate, your alumina and your silicas and the binding or thickening agents which include your water soluble and water insoluble ones. Water soluble ones which are the thickening agents include your alginate and then sodium carboxymethyl cellulose. The water insoluble ones include your magnesium aluminium silicate, your colloidal silica and your sodium magnesium silicate. The detergents or the surfactants include your sodium lauryl sulfate and then your humectants which include your sorbitol, glycerin, polyethylene glycol and the flavoring agents include your peppermint oil, your spearmint oil and oil of wintergreen. The sweeteners and coloring agents include your saccharin, your antibacterial agents which are incorporated extra into your toothpaste would be your triclosan, triclosan your delmophenol, your metallic ions, your zinc citrate and your zinc trihydrate. The anti-caries agents include your sodium monofluorophosphate, sodium fluoride and stannous fluoride. Anti-calculus agents which can be added additionally include your pyrophosphates, your zinc citrates, zinc chlorides and gantrase acid. And then your desensitizing agents include your sodium fluoride, potassium nitrates and stannous chloride. That completes your entire chemical or uh, and mechanical plug control. The one important thing here is your chlorhexidin, when you're advising chlorhexidin mouthwash for your patients, you should always make sure that you give them proper instructions. If not, the patient might not be uh, benefited out of it. The first thing that you should tell the patient is how much of ml he should use. If he should use about 10 ml of chlorhexidin and he should use it twice daily. And always recommend it post brushing. Uh, he has to wait for about half an hour before brushing and he has to wait for another half an hour before he could consume any form of food. And then he should always use it twice daily, once in the morning and once in the night. Now you have to tell him that he has to follow this half an hour gap after the tooth pay, uh, after tooth brushing because 
Now, one of the ingredients of the toothpaste, that is your detergent, which is a sodium laurel sulfate, can react with your chlorhexidine and therefore decrease the availability of chlorhexidine in the mouthwash, therefore decreasing the beneficial property of chlorhexidine. That's it. That, that, uh, this, this, with this small tip, I would like to conclude your plaque control. Thank you.